What? Continuing on our question and answer time regarding the roots of Youth with a Mission. And we've covered my early life and those influences upon my life other than one area that I haven't spoken about and uh, I want to bring that one out a little bit more. I've referred to it and that is the greatest influence on my life in spiritual matters in depth was my mother. We used to spend long hours any time that I was reaching out, she was available, and she would spend hours over the Word with me, answering my questions. And I was uh, one to have a lot of questions as a kid, curious about the book of Revelation, curious about all kinds of things in the Bible, and she spent lots and lots of time with me. She also was a woman of prayer. Every afternoon we had uh, prayer time at 4 o'clock, for one hour, and she would call me when I'd be out playing uh, with the other kids and say, Lauren, it's time to pray. <laughs> and the whole neighborhood knew when our prayer time was. <laughs> now that didn't exclude uh, morning prayers, evening prayers, and, and special prayers and other kind of things, but uh, it was, it was uh, a very normal thing in our family. The... Uh, questions that have come to me, though, have to do with the future that I want to try to cover in this time. The future uh, vision in a variety of ways, especially cross-cultural evangelism, financial questions, and uh, questions having to do with YWAM in the local church and, and uh, relating to other organizations and leaders, as well as some personal areas. And something to do coming from uh, uh, the area of concern about the future in Europe in particular, severe crisis, and a reference to Poland as well. Well, let me start at least. God spoke to us a year and a half ago, a little over a year ago, rather, in the International Council, and he gave us the word administrators. It was from 1 Corinthians 12 that he was speaking where it says first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, listing right on down and it says then and it makes quite a list and comes to the word administrators. And the Lord showed us that he wanted to lift youth with a mission to another level of influence. And I don't, uh, with the glee of the past, look forward to those kinds of statements as much because Every level that God lifts you comes a bombardment and a, a spiritual testing time and attacks that you haven't known before. It uh, just happens in your life at levels as you grow. Individually, it happens corporately. And the, <clears throat> excuse me, the greater influence that God gives to you, the greater attacks you get. It's all in balance, and uh, you don't have to worry about uh, uh, humility. You just have to worry about staying together, <laughs> I, think, I think is the real issue. I uh, have had the privilege of coming alongside uh, those that I greatly admire in God. Uh, I've mentioned Billy Graham. I see him as one of the meekest men I've ever met. When you're up close to him, he, is, he just comes across in every way in the humility of Jesus. And I think that's why God has been able to use him at the level he has, because he's not all tied up about himself. And it's very clear, and he's not trying to impress you, it's just, he's just open. And uh, another sign of stability you'll see is the fact that who are those around him? They've been with him for 30-some years. They know him well, too. And uh, they know each other. There's that protection, that strength in concentric circles right on out. Uh, it's true, as I've, I've uh, gotten to know Brother Andrew, and, and I consider him one of my closest friends. We've traveled together now in 15 nations and uh, four or five continents, five continents together. Uh, 
Pat Robertson, as I've gotten to know him better, I, he's not as, I'm not as close to him as others, but I've, I've had close times with him. I'm to be with him next month again. The, these experiences of knowing these people, you begin to see that nothing happens overnight. God develops. He doesn't just sort of, you know, suddenly you're there. Now that's easy to prove in the Bible because the, the most uh, miraculous baby of all was Jesus. And he took nine months to be born. And he took 30 years to prepare for even to come out of the home situation into the open environment. And uh, even though he was not afraid to go to those that were considered maybe on the outs for the ones that were on the in, like at 12, he was discussing with those religious leaders uh, that others would say, oh, don't even go around them. He would penetrate wherever he'd go. I noticed that as a, a mark of men of God. They don't come to confront in order to, you know, hit head on. They, they come to see people's lives changed. And so these influences have been very real in my life of these various ones, the Camel McAlpines, Joy Dawson, uh, Corey Ten Boom, Jean Darnell, her mother Basilea Schlink. She has been a tremendous blessing to me at key times, writing me long letters. She's just a, you know, tremendous letter writer and sharing what God is showing her as she's been praying for me. These I appreciate, enjoy, covet, and uh, I think that they're really protections for all of us. The, uh, there are so many more, I hate to get started, but uh, Pastor Cho. Pastor Cho of Korea came to our home when he was uh, just an unknown, as my mother put it, Lauren, he's a man of God. You watch him. He's going to go places. He's a man of God, this little Korean man. <laughs> I went to speak in his church for a week uh, in 1971, and I watched it grow from few in number to now over 200,000. And uh, he's a man of God. He serves on the Youth with a Mission Reference Board worldwide, as does Jack Hayford, there, there are many, many that give input from outside into Youth with a Mission to directly answer those questions. Now, as God spoke to us, though, about administration, what he was saying is, I want you to come up and a little higher and release major administrators in YWAM. The question was, how do you release ministries? I think uh, you just obey the Lord, and he, like... Uh, he did at Antioch, told the people in fasting and prayer as they were seeking him, it's time to release Paul and Barnabas. It's not something you mechanically do. It's something that all of life should be a flow of the Spirit. And you don't just sort of take out time for God. You bring t God into everything you're doing. And it's a flow. It's just a flow. And that doesn't mean you don't come apart from God, but that's a part of the flow too. You see the difference of what I'm saying? And so God will call you into times of fasting and prayer. And you obey Him. But you don't say, well, every March I'm going to fast and pray a month or a week or a day. You, you flow with the Spirit of God. And if you'll stay up to date in your relationship, He guides you through a dynamic life rather than a mechanical life. In... In this way, I, I have seen uh, God speak to us, as he did in the International Council regarding administrators, and we began to pray to get understanding of where we were lacking in what God was saying. And so he gave us several areas that we were to communicate to the bases regarding coming up, those that were not being audited properly by outside organizations, those that did not have their legal matters intact and so on. But the big thing was God wanted to release some major administrators. I didn't understand all the purposes, but the next council meeting, the Lord gave us the one word, communicate. Well, I have enjoyed a low profile in YWAM for all the years, and 
we've kept our head down and kept at the grassroots level. We have not sought publicity. In 1973, Time Magazine writer that did the big spread on Jesus Revolution said he wanted to do a big spread on YWAM, Dick Osling. And I said, Dick, I can't do that. This would ruin us as a movement. We, it would just put a spotlight on us and it would puff us up in a way that we're not ready for. I was talking with David Eichmann of Time Magazine recently. He's the, uh, David Eichmann, he's the uh, bureau chief in Jerusalem, has had wide experience with Time Magazine and uh, he's, a, he's taught here last year, a uh, fabulous Christian. But he said, Lauren, you've, you've really been wise in not trying to build through publicity, but rather on content. But he said, you're coming to a place where you're going to get it now, whether you want it or not. <laughs> well, this is what God was saying to us. I told him what God had just said to us three months before. I was talking to him in June of this past year. And uh, we had an article that uh, was a negative one in Newsweek magazine regarding our proselytizing Buddhists, making them Christian. Now, I consider that positive, but it was put in a negative way. The... Uh, thing that we began to see is communication is now taking place because of the spread of YWAM. We've uh, trained over 100,000 people. We have, we have uh, over 3,000 long-term staff, several thousand short-term workers. We uh, have worked now in 160-some nations. The KGB know us, the CIA know us, and we're not a part of either. And... Uh, <laughs> So we're kidding ourselves if we think we can stay low profile. And God was saying to us, communicate. Well, to communicate, we found was bigger than, <laughs> than just, hey, here we are, you know. <laughs> I'm me, who are you? It, uh, it involves people all over the world, leaders, working together, praying, getting understanding from God, what is our vision of the future, and so on. So we sent out a word and brought in leaders, 25 from all over the world, including some facilitators. When you bring together uh, 20 visionaries, you better bring together at least some scribes. Because uh, like in the old days when the prophets would prophesy to one another, you know, and everybody go away and nobody would write it down, <laughs> you wouldn't have much accomplished. And so the visionaries could come together and, uh, and share all the fabulous things. And we'd go away and say, now, how in the world can I communicate all that? <laughs> and that's, uh, so we had to come together. And we brought in the, the eldership uh, from the various regions and the International Council and those in, uh, that are facilitators, communicators. And... We met together for two weeks last May, and the way we did it, we began by praise and then intercession. And then came a prophecy that said we were to all lay down our rods, using the Exodus term of Moses, and we were to throw them down, meaning our positions, our, our self-image of our, our roles, etc. We did it. By going around the room, and all 25 of us resigned to the Lord. <laughs> From anything that we had in roles of authority or, or ministry or, or uh, function, whatever, and we said, we will only take back what you give us back. After we'd done that, we went away to pray individually and ask the Lord what He wanted to reveal to us regarding the future vision. That meant that we were not encumbered by what we had been, but we could suddenly have the blinders off and anything God wanted to say to us, we would be open to receive because we didn't know whether we were going to go into <laughs> what. Now, God has given Youth with a Mission three ministries, evangelism, training, and mercy ministries. All the others fall under those categories. As we went away, though, Floyd McClung, who has a strong burden for urban evangelism, came back a whole vision on children, child evangelism. Well, you wouldn't expect that. You know, you'd think maybe something on the homosexuals, prostitutes, anarchists, or something else. 
But God just crossed over all directions. But after all, half the people in the cities are children. But we don't think that way, see? And God was opening up our vision. And then at the end of the time, at the end of two weeks, when we started, we still asked the Lord, we don't have a position. Or what are we to do when we leave here? And the word of the Lord came and said, these rods are to be made into one tree and together you're to pick it up. Rather than individuality and ministry, I want you to move in a greater flow of unity. Then there will be great fruit from that tree. So the, the budding of the rod is not nearly as good as the blossoming and the fruiting of the tree. But it took us three days to go through what God had said to us in the first uh, three hours of time alone. And then we began to share what we had gotten in the past regarding the future. We put all that down, integrated it, and then came out with a total direction. And then we began to see, and this was over the next seven years, what God was saying to us and began to see where administrators would now have to take it and say, what do we mean? For example, God has shown us we're to pray for and fulfill His conditions and then receive over the, this decade a growth to the point of 50,000 full-time workers if, hear the big if, if we fulfill His conditions. So 50,000 full-time workers, it's great to say that. Let's say Suddenly, you, you have a thousand workers here in Lausanne. You say, wait a minute. We got a housing, transportation, ministry, assignments, all kinds of things. Well, maybe God doesn't want to hear you say. Well, what is it, though? It still involves all kinds of administrative details. Then administrators, ah, oh, we see now. And so if we're going to communicate, you don't just communicate the past or present. You communicate into the future, even if it's on the, what we call, uh, your, your strategic uh, plans where you are just dealing with the next two years and you don't really necessarily make uh, very many long-range pr projections. That's not the point. But it, the point is, is preparation. Preparation for that which is coming and the growth. There's a lot of uh, input that you have to understand and some of this comes in the question, what about the crisis, for example, in Europe? When in Holland, I've heard prophecies regarding the Soviet troops coming into Holland and even dates have been set. Uh, one especially uh, two years ago. Uh, <laughs> I've heard prophecies of the Soviet Union coming into Germany and you'll especially hear that in Germany. Ken Wright went to Germany and got the large group of pastors together and he says now if there's a prophecy there's always a condition what were the conditions they couldn't remember and then two of the men remembered and they said oh yeah unless there's an army of people right raised up to pray he says what 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 understanding did you have we needed at least 10,000 people praying he says all right here we got a group of what two three hundred ministers he said uh, how much would it take you to get uh, 300 apiece praying to save the nation? Oh, we didn't think of that. You see, we don't look at conditions like God does. We look at the promise and <laughs> or the warning. We need to see that these things are always put in there with, when God speaks. Uh, you'll see it in Ezekiel or Jeremiah 18, for example. I went to the potter's house and the one that I said would be, have calamity if they will repent and change and so on, then I will bring blessing instead of calamity and vice versa. If I start, if I promise blessing and then they turn from it, then calamity will come instead. In Norway, I've heard the prophecies they're going to come down from the north. Well, all of these are possibilities. They really are. But in the Middle East... I hear Ezekiel 38 and 39. They're going to come from the north into the Middle East. Now, this is a possibility. And we need to take these things seriously and say, what is God saying regarding what we're to do about it? I believe spiritual warfare is necessary. And uh, people ask, are you a pacifist? No, I'm not. I believe, though, in priorities. I believe that the Christians must rise up and engage in spiritual warfare. And that's not pacifism at all. But that is, uh, that's 
battling at the greatest area possible. If we fail, then the next level comes into play, propaganda or psychological war. If you don't do it spiritually, you're going to have to do it psychologically. So which is best? Having a cold war or a spiritual war? Spiritually hot war. See, deal with the principalities and powers. Deal in the spiritual realm. And you won't have to fall to the other. Then, if that fails, you fa fall to the physical war. And so, if you, if you really want to do something worthwhile... Don't just march with signs and engage in the propaganda war. March on your knees and engage in the spiritual war. It's the whole key. Look at Daniel on the river Euphrates, crying out to God, you know, there fasting and praying. And what happened? Boy, the principalities and powers, the, the things were happening up there from the day he started. We saw one time... In three places in YWAM worldwide, I was with one of the groups in California. Rudy, I think, was there when we had three days fasting and prayer. Were you there in that group? And on the last day, God called us into spiritual warfare against the prince over Greece. And the, that night, the, there was a, a bloodless coup in Greece and a new government raised up and freedom to preach from that day forth. It happened overnight, just like that. So, that doesn't mean everything is solved. You have, to, you have to keep up with the spiritual battles going on all over the world. And they'll be there. And they'll grow on you as far as your level of, of participation all your life if you're growing in the Spirit. So, uh, where in the world was I? Crisis. Ezekiel 38. Middle East. Some facts. You'll see this, for example, in Peter Drucker's book, uh, Managing in Turbulent Times. He says, the Soviet Union has gone bankrupt financially. They are, they are no longer a good credit risk in any terms. The main problem is, is they had put for many decades their eggs in the collective farm basket. That means they put the most of their employees on the farm, and the collective farm has been a total failure. They can't even feed themselves, let alone make money. The second is they put their uh, other majority of their employees in the army, and armies don't make money, they cost. Point number two, the majority of the people of the Soviet Union are Asians, yet Asians are discriminated against. As a result of this, there is a boiling cauldron that is coming up because they're treated like a minority when they're majority, and as a result, they, won't be, they are not allowed in the top levels of, of uh, the Communist Party, of government, of education, of military, or in business. And so it's a boiling thing that is about to spew over. In fact, by the year of 2000, the Muslims at the at present rate will be the majority in a, in a majority in the Soviet Union. So that's another problem. And uh, the whole religious thing is a problem. Then uh, their oil production program is a problem. They can't keep up with their machine and getting oil where they have. But their big one is the balance of payments their hard currency needs. And the only thing that they can do is give up the desire for world leadership and roll over or go outside. And they have one possibility before these pressures meet up. These pressures will mount and uh, peak out at 1985. And uh, after that, it's too late for them to go for world leadership. So they have to do it between the years of 82 and 85. That's the window of time. Now, so this is a potentially crisis time. Now, as Christians, what do we see? One of the possibilities that is being said is Ezekiel 38 and 39. It's, uh, it tells there of the people from the Soviet Union coming from the north down into the Middle East when they have allies of the nations of Libya, Ethiopia, Iraq, and Iran. Now those, that combination, if 15 years ago, people would laugh at you. The Shah in Iran, in Libya prior to Gaddafi, Ethiopia with Haile Selassie, that was impossible even to dream about. 
But all of that has switched now, and we see the poising of the fulfillment of the prophecy. And the entrance into Afghanistan, an hour and a half's drive now from the oil fields of Iran. So everything could be set for Ezekiel 38 and 39. Many are saying that it's not necessary to link that with Daniel's prophecies or even Revelation as far as time sequence. It could be in the seven years. It may not at all. And whatever your views are. But the point is, is there it is as a prophecy. But what does it say? That we're to all be w worried and do what? No. No. Our role is to get ready for the greatest harvest that has ever taken place. So God has prepared us and gotten over our fears and so on and gotten us across the Soviet Union and we've done great research on the nation and, and we've learned of, of all the location of the various hidden people groups of the Soviet Union. We have those in, in manual form now. We've been working. We're starting to do that in China. We are waiting for the big happening and Ezekiel 38 and 39 says that when they come down to Israel they're actually going to be have the armies annihilated there. Total dismantling of their military machine. Uh, that will leave the nation wide open for the preaching of the gospel. And we will have an opportunity of a window of time. Because it would be politically wise to get the Arabs on your side is to destroy Israel and that could, wouldn't be uh, beyond... Uh, maybe their ethics, and uh, of the Soviet Union. And the other part is, is that little Israel is the one nation in the world that wouldn't be afraid to use the atomic bomb or any kind of warfare, nuclear-wise. I mean, let's face it, both the U.S. And, Amer and Russia do not want to use it. They just want to, if they could say, hey, I got a bigger one than you, and they would believe it, that would be enough. <laughs> but Israel is not that way. It's life or death. They knew it in the Holocaust. They don't want to know it in Palestine. And so they have the one possibility of the use of nuclear warheads more than anyone in the world that I would know of. So think of all of those scenarios. But what is it that God wants? If he allows for that, and I trust that uh, millions of soldiers don't have to die, they're people too. But if that does occur... Where are your eyes going to be focused? On vision toward the future in evangelism? Are you called and presently being prepared for a time in which there's going to be a great harvest of open doors where people have never ever once heard the gospel? When you look at the Soviet Union and China, you're looking at uh, China alone, one-fourth of the world's population. The Soviet Union, the fourth largest nation in the world. As you begin to look at those two nations alone, what do you think God says about it? Now, we can get involved in the political part of it, and I don't want to. Uh, even these facts I've given you, I don't care of the political implication. What I really care about is the spiritual because I want that top level of spiritual warfare and spiritual readiness so I don't have to mess around with those other levels that always just seem to be confusing. Now, if I can move into that spiritual level then and be ready, God is saying prepare for the future, then I want to move into that future. And people say, well, what are you doing building a university and buying a ship when Jesus is coming soon? I want to obey the Lord, whatever people's charts say. I want to obey the Lord. And if the Lord tells me to do something, I want to do it. And I know that anything I do in the will of God will not be wasted. Even if the hardware burns up, we still have the software for eternity. Do you know what I mean by that computer terminology? I mean this world and all the things we use in ships and buildings and so on. That's secondary, but the character growth, the principles, the treasures that we're storing in heaven are those things that we will use forever. And why couldn't we use educational 
philosophies and so on in heaven that God gives us. I don't know. We're going to rule and reign with him over maybe whole galaxies. I don't know all about the future in that sense. I haven't planned that far ahead. The, uh, the thing that I do want to see is that which God has told me and told you and that is to preach the gospel to every creature. And he said, this gospel shall be preached as a witness to all nations, ethnic groups. Then shall the income, the Greek word ethnos, means hidden people groups as the name is coming out now. And in Revelation, they're going to be there from every kindred, tongue, tribe, and nation. That means we got to get them from every kindred, tongue, tribe, and nation. And there's a lot of them have never heard the gospel. So the Lord began to show us in our planning time that by the year of 1978, the majority in YWAM should be from the non-Western nations. If we're going to grow to 50,000, we may have 20,000 from the European type nations and 30,000 from the others by then. So what is he saying? He says, get your eyes in the right place in recruiting. Start the schools in the place where there is preparation. Brazilians are now being sent out through Youth with a Mission. And we, we sent 15 last year out as missionaries cross-culturally. And that's a little beginning, but don't despise the day of small things. We're expecting hundreds, then thousands, to go from Latin America into the, all the world to preach the gospel. We're expecting the same thing from Africa and from Asia. We're expecting large numbers to be raised up. Pastor Cho told me one day, he said, Lauren, you get the ship into Korea and I'll load it with Korean missionaries. He says, I'll send out at least a thousand every time you want them. <laughs> I said, thank you. <laughs> it's coming. It's coming. What does that mean for us? That we're going to be colonialist, dominating type mission? No, you're going to fit into the flow and the ministry God gives you, whatever it is. You're not going to be in a place because of your nationality or because of your, your race. You're going to be there because of your calling and you're going to be there because God has placed you and your, your character and spiritual growth has kept up with your ministry growth. That's why you're going to be in the places you will be in. Get ready spiritually for tomorrow, today, because today you're living on yesterday's preparedness. And the whole area of finances come into this, as well as local churches. And uh, to deal with finances and local churches is, <laughs> is miraculous in this time I'm left. I've been talking fast as it is. Oh my. Are they translating simultaneously too? Oh bless your hearts down there. May God anoint you there in, uh, in the French room. <laughs> oh, oh, goodness. In 1964, Don Stevens was an 18-year-old leader of a YWAM team in the West Indies. A church was born from their converts. It was true in another island or two as well. In 65, 1965, Sally McClung was then Sally Claiborne. She was 17. She was on a team in Samoa. She wasn't the team leader, but in that particular island of Tutuila, they saw two churches born. Today, they're two of the larger churches on the island. Kalafi Moala took a team into New Guinea. They saw many churches born. And in every case, we turned them over to different missionaries. In the case of Samoa, it was to Claude Rediger, who was working with us and had invited us in. Today, he's full-time in YWAM. Uh, in New Guinea, it was to John Pastor Camp. I just saw him in, in Holland. He said, the churches are going on strong. He said, God's now calling me to Japan as a missionary. 
but it was those that had the long-term callings. In 1966, on one of the Grenadine Islands, in a town called Castries, a team went in for two months. They saw 400 people saved, baptized, and joined a new church, joined each other. And on that island, uh, the team captain, Wayne Webster, felt God called him to stay and become the pastor. And he stepped out of YWAM and associated with another uh, missionary group that had the long-term responsibilities of, of establishing churches. No, we haven't felt God has called us to be a denomination. YWAM is a missionary organization, to use the modern term. The Catholics would call it a uh, preaching training order. In the New Testament terms, it would be called a uh, apostolic band or team or group. And this is not new. In fact, there has never been a time that I can see in the church history where there hasn't been the combination of the local church and that which I would term the traveling church, or Watchman Nee would call it the workers and the local church. That always implied to me that the local church, or church didn't have to work. So I, I, I agree with the concept, but I just use another term. Or Dr. McGavern and those in the Fuller Seminary would call it the sodality and the modality. Uh, Charles Mellis, one of the heads of a missionary organization that went there and then wrote a book, and he spent about three of his chapters on youth with a mission, I said, Lauren, why don't you use sodality and modality? I says, I can't even understand it. How can I use it? <laughs> uh, the terms aren't uh, conversant with me. I, I'm not conversant, rather, with the terms. And uh, the, uh, the Moravians are celebrating in the United States their 250th uh, year of celebration, anniversary. And they've written a manual over their history, and their last chapter says... Uh, that Youth with a Mission is the closest group today to what they were at their beginning. And uh, I, I, don't, I haven't read it yet. I just uh, got that word this past week. But uh, I just, I don't know where we are. We're just trying to obey the Lord. But I do know where we are in the sense of the, the scriptural context versus a local church and a, quote, missionary organization. In the... Uh, Old Testament, you'll see the schools of the prophets living in community, getting trained, and then moving out in teams. That was not a new sight around the country of Israel when John the Baptist came along from the, near the Qumran community out where they'd been. He had his disciples, and he took them out on a field trip in outreach. And uh, as he came, it was God's plan for John the Baptist to publicly introduce Christ in his ministry. And Christ's ministry was in the flow of that, uh, that culturally understood plan where they were not the local group with the elders in a local town of the religious leaders and so on, the scribes, the Pharisees, and so on, but they were the prophetic traveling voice into the local scene. And uh, re re renewal and revival would come in often from this, this, uh, this quarter. And so when Jesus was baptized publicly, it was also a public commissioning of his ministry, and uh, it was done by this traveling group because that was, in that context, then the people watched him as he took his disciples and traveled around too. And so to say that this is not the highest form is to say that Jesus was not doing what was really best. What he should have done was stopped and and been a pastor of a local church. So there is that teaching in the world today that says uh, <clears throat> the ultimate form is the local church and the others are just simply to lead up to the time when uh, they will no longer be useful because the local church will be in its full heyday, to use a Greek term. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> that's, that's just not... Scriptural is not even true to the life of Christ. It's not true to the life of Paul. Paul was an ap he was not just a person, but he had an apostolic team, and they moved from place to place. He had many on his team. He traveled usually from ten to fourteen people were with him. And as you begin to look at Tychicus and Ar Ar 
Articus and Gaius and, and uh, Zenos and Luke and Timothy and the various ones that were a part of his team. You get a lot of teaching on this area. I'll leave that one for a whole tape you can hear. But uh, in the process, they planted local churches. And their role was renewal to local churches. There's a combination. And I believe that, uh, well, and as you go through history, whether Augustine, Benedictines, or Franciscans, or Moravians, or uh, Carey who took his team out to India, he was not a lone man, or, or the various missionary movements, as they became movements, the Hudson Taylors and others, they became, often, they would form communities, training centers, they would start schools, start churches, and so on, but they were not to remain and pastor or become a denomination, they were to release ministries. And that was their role. And the two work very well together, even to this day, until the coming of our Lord, they will. Both are of God. Not one, not the other, both are of God. And we need to see that, that that's our role, and then we can minister to the local churches in renewal, in providing a channel to go out into all the world, and to be a part of that which God has called us into. So there's a lot in that area. I'd like to say a lot more, but uh, we'll just leave it to go to the, I think, about the last thing I can cover. And that's uh, the area of finances, and there's a whole area on faith and finance that I just uh, won't uh, try to get into all of these things, but God has taught us through the years that finances and His Word all go together. And we put it in a little phrase, where God guides, He provides. Or we've also said, where He leads, He feeds. And that's an important concept. And you will find that he will do it to teach you of his greatness, of his character, of his provision, one. And you must live it out or you won't be able to prove God. Number two, you, uh, he will also teach you in order to unify you with others. And that's why he often does it not through the raven, but through those who are, are in the body of Christ being spoken to. And we have to, in humility, learn to receive as well as enjoy, learn to give. And uh, the third is that he will test you. And in this way, you will grow in the great grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ through even finances. And uh, there's a tape that talks about holdups to finances. And uh, I think that that's the fourth, is to teach you uh, the ways of God, the will of God, and also his character. And so in that that area, I look back over the financial uh, challenges through life. I've given you one or two, but uh, on this particular building, God began to speak to us. He showed us, first of all, to rent this place. When we came back from the first summer, we had one week and all of the teams were coming in. It wasn't that many people, but there were 30, uh, 35 from the new school and uh, 28 from the old, so we had maybe 60 people that needed a place to come to. And someone was uh, in this area, his name was Dennis Kifiak, one of the students from Canada, and he said, oh, uh, Lauren, I saw a, a hotel. It was grown up all around and closed up. It was this hotel, Hotel de Golf, and uh, named after the golf course next door. So, uh, we came and asked the lady if she would rent it to us. She wasn't interested. We said we'd clean up the place if she'd just let us use it for a week. Well, that sounded like a good deal, so we got to rent it for a week. And uh, God began to minister to her during that week, and she let us then rent it for three months. And then it extended after that to a year. And then it was now January 71, and uh, we began to pray and the Lord began to show us we were to buy this and it was on January 14th in this room that God poured out His Spirit and for several hours there was an outpouring of understanding, revelation. It was thrilling. There was a purging first, a repentance, and then a, a release, a burst of God. And He began to tell us and somebody looked up 
a scripture and someone else, another one that God spoke to them and it talked about the first, 14th day of the first month. The 14th day of the first month. We suddenly realized this was January 14th, 1971. And that God wanted to release. And the, the words just came so impactually around the room. Anybody here during that day? Yes, Rudy again. I'm always amazed. This is, of course, the growth, and those that were here are all over the world right now. And they're, they're learning to buy buildings and so on in the same way that God taught us right here. So God will give you a project, by the way, if you let him. It'll be tough. You think, oh, why did this test come along? It's to teach you. Well, anyway, we needed to either buy it or leave. That was our choice as far as a building. And uh, we'd never bought a building before in Youth with a Mission. And so uh, you can see again the growth. This is 82. That was 71. And today we are in more than 100 places throughout the world with permanent uh, locations of ministry. And uh, the, the thing that God was uh, showing us was that we had to do everything possible. Then he would do what we couldn't do. And we were told that we had to have $60,000, I'll use dollars, as a down payment. And it was due on June the 1st. So we, we sold things that we had. Uh, my wife and I sold, we had a house that I'd bought for her. I was married and uh, just been renting out and paying for itself. And so the Lord showed us to sell it and to clean out our anything money we had in any account and just give it. And so we did that and uh, paid off all, all any kind of debts or encumbrances or so on first and then gave everything that was left. And then uh, the Lord began to show us to uh, uh, start giving sacrificially. He began to teach us in the ways of God and finances in new areas we'd never seen. And uh, I think that first day we had $10,000 or so given toward. And then it went up to 20000 And uh, we had a lot of tests in the meantime uh, prior to that. Just the I, I, different things that God led us into. I better not get into the, those details. But by June the 1st, we were still lacking about $20,000. If we didn't have it on June, June the 1st, uh, we would not only... Uh, be kicked out the following day, but we would lose uh, a deposit of 10,000 francs, which was at that time about uh, two or three thousand dollars. Things have changed. <laughs> it was 420, 430 to one. So uh, as uh, I went to the post office the last day, it had been a holiday in the United States, and we were not known very far, but in the post office there were several letters and when I added up all the money it came to just over $60,000. And I took it in and uh, we had quite a spiritual battle in the bank as well. Uh, just a tirade of a, a person that was, was just uh, not moving in uh, the spirit other than that which is a foreign spirit. And I've never, I sat around the there were lawyers sitting here and, and uh, bankers and people. I'd never seen anything like this. this, this display, a spiritual display of an evil spirit. It went on for an hour, and I, and I just sat there quietly praying. And after the end of the hour, then the person was normal again, and, said, and the signing went on, and everything was done. And I walked out of there saying, Thank you, Lord. I see it's a spiritual battle all the way. Even when you get your money, the devil has to have one last fling of frenzy. And so that often happens. And uh, watch those kinds of things. My time is up. And uh, I think we'll, we'll close with this. Uh, though I've not quite finished all your questions. But uh, I want to just bow in prayer and say something to the Lord. Lord, I, as I walk down these experiences of my mind, I want to just say what's in my heart of gratitude towards you. You've revealed yourself in so many ways through the years. And you're more real, Lord, than anything else in my life. And I thank you because I see that it came 
uh, by your grace. It came because of you love, you pursued, and you're, you're doing this for all of us. And I don't stand uniquely in this, but every one of us in this room have been led, Lord, to one degree or another in your ways, and that's why we're here at this time. And so we're all learners together, and I want to learn this year, Lord, more than I've ever learned before. And I thank you, Lord, for what that means, but I also thank you that your grace is sufficient in all the tests and the trials that may come. And you've been sufficient in the past, and we know that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll appreciate your...